Hi there, and welcome to a new episode of Impact Talks. Today we have William Collis with us. He's a he's a startup founder of several startups, among which Genji Analytics and Oxygen Esports. Really excited to have you on. I loved your TED Talk as well as all the other things like your books and stuff that, like that. But tell the people where they might know you from and what you do. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much for being here. It's a pleasure to appear on the, you know, on Input Talks with you and share a little bit about what I know about esports. Um, I guess for the people listening, you know, they might know me from a couple of different places. Um, you know, one is they might know me from the book that I published, which is the Book of Esports, which is I think one of the more popular takes and overviews of the esports industry. Um, certainly, some people might know me from a podcast I have called The Business of Esports, um, which is a quite popular podcast tracking sort of the business side and the commercial side of what's going on in competitive gaming. Um, and people actually might know me from, you know, some of the businesses I founded and sold in the space. Um, and I've created a couple of companies, most notably um, Genji Analytics uh, and a pro team called OXG. Um, but you know, who knows? Maybe, maybe some, I've actually taught at a few colleges over my time too. So maybe there'll be some past or former students, you know, listening as well. So I've done a bunch of stuff in the space. I'm uh, really excited to have you on as we're entering kind of the second half of our uh, season of the podcast. We just passed the 50th episode. Um, and so one of the things that I kind of didn't have in the first 50 was something among uh, esports, especially the business of esports. Uh, yet I do game almost every day. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think for the first bit, what surprised me when I got into, you know, the world of esports, uh, I have a colleague who has an entire arena of esports close to Amsterdam. And um, one of the things that surprised me was how big the whole thing is. And I can assume we have a lot of tech startups and stuff like that listening, but also maybe investors listening. How can you explain kind of from the beginning for somebody who doesn't understand, is this just still a hobby? Are people still just playing video games or are these like legit athletes? What is this industry that you're in? Yeah, wow, there's so much there to unpack. I mean, we could spend like the entire talk, you know, going into what's actually going on in the space. But maybe let's get a few fundamentals in place first and then sort of talk about some of the trends which have really propelled esports from something that maybe you might have heard about to really, I think, one of the defining movements of our generation. Um, so first, I think just the good thing to describe is what are esports, right? Because like people hear that they have many different images and fundamentally esports, you know, the way I think about them is they're just competitive video games, right? Um, the secret, you know, and sort of like anything that's competitive, you know, what makes a sport a sport, right? I think when you really want to distinguish something like baseball, let's say from curling or, you know, maybe polo, what really matters is the number of people who take interest in it, the media exposure, the spectators. And so the big thing that's really happened in esports is it's gone from just being competitive gaming, because like way back, you know, when on like the original Nintendo, there were two player modes, you know, you could be competitive. I mean, the original Pong, right? You played one on one, you know, um, but we had the competitive piece, but now we have the spectator piece. What's happened is people have wanted to start to watch, and there's been an explosion in terms of viewership, you know, to the point where major esports events like the League of Legends, you know, are renting out like Madison Square Garden and selling out the whole thing. And so it's really that combination of competitive games plus spectators that makes esports what it is today and creates an interesting business opportunity and professional opportunity to talk about. So then... Let's separate those two things in turn. So what's happening on the business side, right? And what's happening maybe on the professional, and by the professional side, I mean like the pro gaming side, right? Like the people who are playing games themselves, what's going on, right? So on the business side, um, as there has been this huge boon in viewership, right? Well, just like any media-driven industry, when there are lots of eyeballs, you can start to make money, right? You can have advertising, you can have sponsorship, you can have ticket sales, you can have all of these things. And more prominently, as the competitive side and getting good at games has risen in importance too, there's now just a bigger market of gamers that you can promote to who might want to get better in certain ways, who might want to advertise their engagement in the gaming lifestyle, right? And so all of this means esports has exploded into a huge market. Um, 
the estimates on exactly how big it is varies. Um, some numbers put it about a billion. I'm a fan of having it north of 20 billion. It depends on what you include in the space. You know, a big question, for example, is do you include the revenues from the games themselves? If you do, you get it closer to 20 billion. If you want to excise that, you know, you can argue about what the number is. But fundamentally, that is a massive industry to essentially have appeared overnight, right? Because back in like 2010, yeah, there were some competitive game tournaments, but nobody was talking about this being even a billion dollar opportunity, let alone a $20 billion opportunity, right? So there's been a massive explosion and that's lit, allowed a lot of companies to be created and become successful. And it's driven, I think, really strong returns for investors. And so as a result, you see tons and tons of investment capital has historic, has flown in, has flowed into the space over the last few years. Um, by some estimates, I've seen, you know, they peaked at like a billion dollars a year. And you also then, with all of this growth and business taking place, you now see major companies being extremely active in esports, right? And when I say major companies, I'm not talking about gaming specific companies. I'm talking about Toyota. I'm talking about Louis Vuitton. I'm talking about, you know, Bud Low, Bud Light, right? Like literally any, pretty much any major consumer brand you can think of has woken up to the fact that there's a big industry here with a big audience. And so they want to position their brand there for growth and success. And so if you're a business person listening to this podcast, this is why you kind of need to care about the business side because it has huge numbers, high growth, and it's an entirely new audience that you know can be tapped to market products to and to build affinity with. So that's the business side, right? What's happening on the pro gaming side, like the actual people who play these games? And here, it's a similar story, right? Is now there's money being generated by the space. And most importantly, the money is being tied to eyeballs. And so platforms like Twitch, you know, for people who don't know, Twitch is a service that lets you as a gamer essentially stream yourself playing games, um, develop an audience, and, you know, eventually become an internet celebrity. And it's created sort of this influencer market for gamers, where pro gamers who are very good at what they do can monetize their brand. And it's allowed professional gaming to become kind of a two-pronged lifestyle. On the one hand, you have people who are ultra competitive and who are sort of known for winning major tournaments and being really good. On the other hand, you have pro gamers who are sort of known as being more entertainers, right? And people who, while they're still probably very good at the game, they're more just fun to watch. You know, like, yo, that guy's really entertaining. I love it. He makes me laugh or she makes me laugh, right? Right. And again, this has created sort of a new career and a lifestyle path for people who are interested in games um, to really take that passion and turn it into something that can generate an audience and have other people care about. And so the result is, you know, there's an industry here now. There are careers here now. And um, these didn't really exist, you know, until very recently. And so there's a ton of growth and interest in the space. Um, and that obviously makes it even more exciting because it's new. So that's the quick, you know, overview from 10,000 feet of what's going on in esports and, you know, where we are today. Does that make sense, Loba? Is there anything you'd want me to dig into there a little more? No, definitely the fundamentals make sense. I think it also shows for anybody who's new to this, how massive it is. Also the growth potential, because I obviously believe also in the growth potential. Um, partially why I was so excited to have you on. I think one of the other questions that I had was, uh, so that's kind of the meta overview, looking from above. Um, what are some practical businesses um, that, you know, not a Toyota can start, but, you know, startups um, can, can explore in this space? Well, there's just tons and tons because fundamentally gaming is i mean i let's talk back and say you know again i hate to sort of answer your question with like a step back but think about what gaming is right like if you really think about what video games are they're probably the most multidisciplinary thing in you know honestly i believe like you know maybe the world right they combine you know skills like programming which we consider to be a very hard skill with something like art and graphic design which we would consider to be very subjective right and maybe artistic they combine that with all sorts of traditional businesses because the big games companies are public and worth billions of dollars right so you know that needs finance that needs brand management that needs marketing now you have a rise of pro teams because all of these gamers are getting involved in the pro team space and so that needs player management talent management you know production and you know content creation right there's whole verticals around that and then you know you you can take it you know even even a little step further right 
and um you know think about like you know people now i've written a book on the space for example right like literally like there we're getting to the point where there's creation of sort of historical value taking place in the industry um and so what this means is the opportunities to be involved in gaming and esports are fundamentally pretty limitless because you could do a business on the coding side that's very hard and data focused you could do a business on the talent management side that's completely different you could do an art business right um you know so there are lots of opportunities for people to get involved in the space and build companies you know i've built many and they've all been pretty different from each other but this is sort of maybe the bigger piece to rest on here is like as a founder of a business how do you know that the time is right for you to build your business? You know what I mean? Because I'm saying, look, there's lots of opportunity in the space. We sort of are in this gold rush period of esports. I think that's going to continue for a long time because we can talk about this, but I think the ceiling on gaming, we're not even close to reaching in terms of what it means, not just as an industry, but for like humankind, right? Like I really mean that. I think this is like important for the future of humanity, what's happening here. So the question is, you know, there's all these great, you know, things, spaces, and you could have an idea how do you know the time is right for you to found your company? And, you know, this is something I wrestled with a lot as an entrepreneur. You know, when do I think it's right to begin a business? And I think the answer is three things. First of all, it's probably now. Like, I hate to say it, but like the bias should be if you're trying to decide between now or later, it probably should be now that you're doing this thing. Um, because the reason is I think you're better off in a space if you're sooner rather than later, right? If you're too soon to a space, you just have to wait a while for your business to take off. If you're too late, your business can't exist because somebody else has done it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, but the other thing is, is people were naturally, I think, you know, we're naturally like biased against change, right? And so if you decide to do it later, you're always going to do it later. So I think, first of all, you need to approach companies with a bias of do it now, right? Like your default should be, you should rather than arguing yourself, why should I do this? You should be arguing with yourself, why shouldn't I do this? But that's the first criteria. The other two criteria, though, are kind of the checks on that, which stop people from going willy nilly, right? You know, the first is how serious, you know, are you really capable of committing yourself you know, to this idea and seeing it through. And that means both, you know, like financially, do you have a plan that's credible for how you're going to get this business working, right? But that also means like emotionally, right? Like, I don't think any business succeeds. I really mean this without a founder or actually a group of founders who truly believes in what the business is building. Like, I, I really mean that. At the end of the day, and we can talk more about this, but it's such a hard path building companies. There's so much uncertainty. You know, there's so much, you know, like, you know, just like basic decisions where you have no idea which way to choose. And you kind of, like, it's really hard. If you don't really have conviction around it, then what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like, seriously, like, if you don't believe so, there's the seriousness factor, the readiness factor. And then the third factor is, who are you doing this with? And I really mean that is the secret to successful startups is, again, I don't think great companies are built by themselves. I think they require teams of excellent people. And with a startup, I think the people who you're co-founding with are absolutely critical. You have to trust them. And more importantly, they have to have extremely incremental skill sets to yours, right? Like if you're a business person, I'm more on the business background, like probably don't do startups with other business people because you're not adding skills to the company. You know, look for people with a different skill set, like somebody who's a programmer or an artist or a designer or but try to find people who are as passionate about the idea of you with complementary skill sets. And so if you're serious, you have a credible plan. If you have other people who are ready to go on that plan with you, then like I said, the bias should be now. And, you know, that I hope that's a helpful digression. But that's how I sort of advise people generally You're saying, hey, I'm thinking of starting something. Well, those are your three checklists. You know, there's many sub boxes we can go through that make that more nuanced. But fundamentally, those are the three questions you should answer before you go. And so if we dive deeper then into the industry and you have all those checklists set, which parts would you be advising nowadays to to enter? Is it maybe starting a physical location where people can get together and do competitive esports like you're saying Madison Square Garden gets sold out uh, those type of things is it more in the digital space uh, where would you advise where do you see a gap I guess it's a tough question because I, I still think most of the space is greenfield space to be honest with you and the reason for that is I think what's really happening here is games are sort of like the future of humanity right like if you think of what's gone on in our life right 
It's been, and this is certainly a story in my lifetime, you know, it's been a story of technology infiltrating and coming closer to the human body, right? Like, you know, if you think like basically, you know, you grew up and, you know, like maybe, maybe, you know, depending on how old you are, maybe computers were things that just just like lived at research universities. Then you could have them maybe in your office. Then you can have them at home. Then you could have them portable. Now you carry them around in your pocket. Like technology is infiltrating and coming so close to the human body. And that means technology is infiltrating our daily life more and more. You know, this is sort of a little bit what I talked about in my TED Talk. But, you know, think about what's happened in the pandemic and how many interactions we've had have transitioned online, right? Like, you know, for the first time now, you know, I think it would be unheard of. You said 50 years ago, you'll meet your future spouse online, right? That happens all the time now through dating and matching websites and, you know, like, and that's like a pivotal event in your life, right? We're trusting more and more to technology to bring us together. I mean, right now, recording this podcast, right? Like 50 years ago, I'd have to fly out. We'd be in a studio. Now we're doing this remotely and we're able to have a real human interaction. So what's really happening is, the digitization of technology is connecting us and infiltrating our lives in more ways. And I think games are the ultimate expression of connectivity and digitization today. They combine the most diverse disciplines. They have, I think, the most complex simulations and narrative environments for people to engage in, right? Like a video game is far more complicated than a Zoom call, right? You know what I mean? Like there's far more going on. And so as the rise of technology becomes more important, Games as a whole, right, games as a whole are going to turn into more and different things and they're going to become a bigger and bigger share of just how we interact. But, you know, if you can kind of tell my bias here is I think at the root of all of esports is something I think many people miss, which is its connectivity. Right. Like I think if you think of games, we have this image of like a solo experience and being locked in your, you know, the territorial image of somebody like locked in their room or their basement playing by themselves. But really, no, the trend today in esports, it's founded on competition and to compete, you have to have people to compete with. It's about bringing people together. And so I generally have a bias, I think, overall in the space towards connectivity driven businesses. Right. Because I think so much of the power of technology is bringing us together. And conversely, so much are Proversely, I don't know as a word, but you know, that's so much of the power of games too, right? Is how they can bring us together and what relationships and things they can help us forge. What is your opinion on the other day? I don't know if you saw that uh, Mark Zuckerberg launched this virtual Oculus conference room situation. It looked like a video game. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a great example, you know, Lovo, of sort of what I'm talking about. Like, first of all, you have probably one of the most important companies in the world, Facebook, you know, going into, you know, constructing virtual worlds. And you can even go further, not just that Oculus, their actual purchase of Oculus, right? Like, why Facebook, you know, I think their mission statement they talk about is, is bringing people together and connecting people. And they saw, you know, not this year, but, you know, literally, I th when was the Oculus acquisition? Like over five years ago, right? I think it was far longer than that. They saw the power of VR and fundamentally what is a gaming platform because most people use Oculus. If you have a VR platform today, it's for games. They saw the value of that as like bringing people together and this is going to be a connectivity medium. And I think, and this is something that, you know, I have learned, but we don't realize how quickly technologies reach tipping points in our lives. You know what I mean? Like, and I, I think the thing that really hits me with that is the smartphone, right? Which, sorry, I know it's a bit boring, but like, you know, when I started my career, I had a BlackBerry, right? And I thought the BlackBerry was great because you could tap on it and, you know, write emails or whatever, right? But like, it wasn't life changing. You know, it wasn't like, oh my God, I got to have a BlackBerry, you know, by my bed every night. You know, it was just, I needed it for work. And then, and so when the smartphone was coming out, you know, I was like, well, it's a better BlackBerry. It's going to be similar use cases for the BlackBerry. But the critical thing is the technology of what you could put in the phone, the, simplif the simplification of the interface, you know, it reached a tipping point where the machine there was powerful enough that basically instantly we went to smartphone adoption in the United States. I mean, it's crazy. And it created, again, I think Apple is the world's most valuable company today on the back of that tipping point technology. I think there are a lot more tipping point technologies coming. I think VR is an obvious tipping point technology i think people look at oculus headsets today and people are wearing them and they look kind of weird and maybe they're tethered to their computer and they're stumbling around a room and people are like well that doesn't look so great or yeah sure i bet it's fun if you're doing it but i don't get you know but we're just not at the tipping point yet but we're very i believe we're very very close and i think that's why you see major companies like facebook diving into this really aggressively because they recognize there's a tipping point here 
right? Like they recognize that the technology is getting close enough that it's ready for use cases. And fundamentally, gamers for VR were just the early adopters, right? But now we're going to see that gaming-like universe extended to connectivity. Um, you know, meetings, I think, is the example is first one here, but it's going to go everywhere eventually. I really believe it's going to, you know, if you read my book, you know, a thesis is you're sort of going to end up in this dual world, you know, where you're choosing some experiences in the real world because they're easier and they make more sense. And you're choosing some experiences online and digitally because they're easier and they make more sense. And again, a great example, this is this interview, right? We could have done this in person. We chose to do it digitally. We don't think that's an amazing fact because we're doing this all the time. But if you look in the course of human history, it's absolutely incredible that this is a digitized interaction. That's true. Also, the fact that, you know, I've done it so many times now. I've done it physically as well as digitally. And, and yet I find that the conversation, if it lasts long enough, gets as comfortable almost as the physical interaction. Um, when uh, COVID was actually going away, I had this discussion with my team whether we should just go back to physical. And I just really like the flexibility of the digital interaction. And I feel like I still get a similar interview experience where I connect with people. Um, which is really interesting. Yeah, and it, it's just, for me, it's just, I'm still stunned at how incredible it is that we can have this level. Like, it shows you that how humans interact with other humans, right? It's almost a bit more fundamental than, you know, like, I think we used to think, like, oh, there's something about being there in place. There's something about the handshake. And, and yeah, I'm not saying that the physical world isn't important. Like, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, we live in the physical world, right? But I'm saying more and more... As technology, not just as we adapt to technology, but as technology adapts to us, more and more the digital experiences can be as good and certainly more convenient than the physical experiences in a way that I think makes us want the digital to live alongside the physical. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I want to step back for a second. Um, obviously, people don't really know your background. Uh, we covered it really slightly. You've shown a lot of obviously experience and insight into the industry. But I want to go back uh, to the beginning because you've had a very interesting career, including lecturing about esports, uh, which I found fascinating. I didn't know this was a thing, didn't even know where you could do that. Uh, but so I would like to go back to, you know, the beginning, like when, what did you even study to end up where you are today? How did it kind of start? That's a, wow, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I guess the first thing is we should start with I've always played games, right? I think, you know, and I think that's actually really important to me as I genuinely come from a place of authenticity in this space. You know, there's a story that my family tells about me where they didn't want me to have a Nintendo when I was little. But the neighbors had a Nintendo. So like every day I would go over and be like, can I play your Nintendo? I'd knock on the door. And then finally they like stormed over one day and they're like, just give the kid our Nintendo. We don't want him to come over here anymore, you know? So I truly have always loved games. So in that sense, you can probably think that the story begins when I'm very young because it's a passion that I've had. But, you know, a more applicable answer is, you know, look, after college, I went to Amherst College, you know, shout out to the College Upon the Hill. Um, you know, after Amherst College, I, you know, thought I would go into a very traditional business career. Um, so I worked in management consulting and, you know, that actually ended up being a great experience for me because I realized that it wasn't just enough for me to be, you know, like I had an interest in business, right? But it wasn't just enough for me to be working in business and any old business wouldn't do, right? And management consulting is fundamentally you know, you're traveling around meeting with very different companies. And some people find that exciting that one day you're in, you know, an energy industry and the next day you're in a transport industry. And I, I really realized through that process, I was like, no, you know, I want to be working on industries and things that I really, really care about and that are close to me. And fundamentally, you know, I'm pretty simple. I think that they're, you know, there are industries that, you know, keep people alive longer and benefit humanity through health and things. And there are businesses that make us happy. And, I wanted to be on the happy side of the business, you know, and work on things like that because I, you know, I go back to just, I love, you know, entertainment, honestly, I do. And so, um, so then I, you know, was lucky enough that I went to business school. I went to Harvard business school, picked up some great skill sets there and a network, ended up working, you know, in industry and actually the toy industry for a while and which was an amazing experience and really fun. Um, but ultimately you know, as this was going on, I was seeing what was happening in games. And because I was still playing games all the time, and I was seeing 
how games were transitioning from something that I would have called, you know, a hobby and maybe a great pastime to something where like you really needed business acumen. You really needed people who knew how to build companies and manage companies because the space was big enough to have companies grow and be managed in it. And so, you know, that ultimately led me, you know, to a realization where I founded my first company in the space. Um, and, you know, then the rest is kind of history. From there, I built, you know, a couple other businesses, um, started my podcast. Well, what was and the then... first company uh, again? And which year was that in? So, oh, my gosh, I can't even remember the first year. It was a while ago. It was probably, you know, five or six years ago or more. But the first company was, um, now, is that right? Yeah, probably about that. The first company was um, called Gamer Sensei. And this was a coaching company, right? So this business was fundamentally, um, you know, so I mentioned I love games, right? I'm not very good at video games. That's like the other secret. I'm pretty bad. But, you know, if you think of competition and what's going on and, you know, like if competitive games are going to be a thing, well, you know, I was losing all the time. And I was looking around and I was like, well, you know, if you want to, um, you know, if you want to get better at tennis, you got a tennis coach, right? If you want to get better at golf, you got a golf coach, right? We all know, you know, you do baseball, you practice baseball, you go to baseball practice, you have a baseball coach, you know, if you want to get good at baseball, why can't you have a video game coach? Like that feels like a thing that should exist. And more to the point, it was a service I really wanted. I was like, I would absolutely pay somebody to teach me how to get better at this. I'm terrible. And so that was sort of the idea and the emphasis that let me take the first leap into the space and build that business. Um, so as I said, I did Gamer Sensei, then I founded some other stuff, and then today I have, you know, the book of esports, and then, you know, um, the podcast as well. And I'm happy to talk about anything I did in between, the stuff I'm doing right now, the book, you know, whatever is of interest. Yeah, I definitely want to go a bit uh, more chronological. So, because uh, the toy company you worked for, that was Hasbro, if I'm correct? That's right, yes, I worked for Hasbro. Which is, uh, I've met like some of those traditional companies like, you know, Lego and Hasbro and, and all this. Hasbro I haven't met yet, but... Uh, my kind of, when I look at those traditional companies, I always think that's a corporate. How, and they make mostly physical type of games. And when they kind of venture into the digital space, maybe I'm missing something, but it's like the games aren't as, you know, good as the Rockstar or Ubisoft or something like that. Is that correct? Or I mean, you sort of fun. There, there are exceptions to this rule, but sort of fundamentally right. Like it's a toy company. It's more interested in making toys than it is in making games, right? And so the specialization for the company is toy. Um, and so you might say, well, so what did you, what did you learn in your time there that you could apply into the digital game space? Oh, that's a great question. That's a really great question. Well, first and foremost, right? Like and. It's, it sounds obvious, but it's really true is I learned how companies are structured and why companies have certain processes in place, right? Because Hasbro is a very big company, right? You know, it's I think it's the largest toy company, the second largest toy company in the world, and a lot of toys get made and consumed, you know? And so I was lucky enough, you know, and it's also, I think, a very warm company and a very friendly company. I think it has a very good corporate culture. And so I was able to, you know, in this business and in my time working there, I was, you know, I think somewhat, I don't want to say theoretical about it, but I was able to see what processes people had, how the business was set up to run efficiently, but also to run like as a pleasant place to work and a fun place to work. And that really mattered to me because, you know, if I'm particularly when you consider entrepreneurship, you know, and I, I probably when I was early in Hasbro, I didn't, I maybe had an interest in it, but I didn't realize it. Um, you know, to be honest with you, like, I think I was all about creating things. I wanted to just create stuff. I think it's, you know, I think I'm a creative person. And so for me, that was, you know, maybe toy was one outlet for that. But, you know, later on, I discovered that companies could be an outlet for that, too. Um, but fundamentally, um, you know, I knew that it was important to have places that are fun to work. And from my time in consulting, I could see that some companies just were not as fun to work at as other companies. And they were all big and they all made money and they all did well, right? And I was like, well, if you can make, you know, a company that's fun or not fun, go and make the fun company. And so that was a big thing I took away from it. Um, you know, the other thing I took away from it, I think, candidly, was, you know, a sense of scale and change. And that's a little bit more abstract. But like, Toys are probably one of the oldest things, you know, that you can sort of like, I mean, like toys have been with us since prehistory, right? Like, you know, there's dolls and, and, but they've evolved so much over time. 
so much over time, you know, right down to basically this idea of how they're produced. You know, like if you think of toys even 100 years ago, they were probably basically made by, you know, smaller corporations or in some systems, you know, situations even probably artists, right? And now there's this massive global infrastructure around toy and how toys are produced. And it really showed me, look, like, you know, you might think that this is something that's, you know, silly or trivial, like putting a Captain America figure, you know, in a kid's hand at home, right? Like that might not seem like it's important, but actually it's connected to this big arc in history. It's a huge business opportunity and it's undergone a lot of fundamental change. So the way toys are made now is nothing like the way toys are made 30, 40 years ago. And I think that arc, you know, really helped me realize that if even like, like, I guess, how things are changing. And I think I felt that keenly at Hasbro when I was there because there was a lot of digitization going on. Games were becoming more popular, right? Like you had digitally integrated toys launching. And so I was even seeing there how that space was changing. Um, I think that was sort of the other thing I took away. I mean, there's a lot more, obviously, you know, you develop skills in a professional setting and, you know, we can talk all about that. But fundamentally, the abstract things and maybe the more important things were those two. So when you then started uh, Gamer Sensei, uh, was this while you were at Hasbro or was it literally like back, back over the fence? I'm starting. No, no, no. I, I left. I left. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a really fascinating story, you know, which is I had a friend who my co-founder. So I mentioned earlier, you know, having a co-founder is really important, um, you know, for these businesses. Right. You need to have a co-founder who you know, you really trust and value. And I was lucky enough for Gamer Sensei, my co-founder was a guy called Rohan Gopaldis, who was literally was one of my best friends. I mean, he was the best man at my wedding. And we were always joking, you know, way back, we met in business school, right? And we were always joking that we would do a startup together. You know, like, it's gonna be awesome. Like, we'll go, you know, we'll build, one day we'll be in a business, we'll work together. We'd be so great if we worked together. And actually, you know, I would say at that time, I didn't have a lot of courage in entrepreneurship. I think now I have a lot of courage because I've, done it I know what it looks like and I've had success and that makes it easy to be brave right but back then I didn't really have any courage at all you know and and I think you can even see that in you know I chose a big company to work at like you know I could have worked for a smaller company I probably could have even worked for a startup after leaving business school but I was working at a big company um and you know um and uh, and I, by the way I don't mean that again as a not I think there are you can be brave and different. I'm talking about like brave for entrepreneurship, like willing to take that risk. And actually it was Rohan who had kind of a near death experience, actually. You know, I don't want to share too much of his story, but he basically had a moment in his life where he called me up on the phone and he said, I, you know, this thing has happened to me. It's made me reevaluate my life and my own priorities. I want to spend time with people I care about. And I want to, you know, do things with people that I, I want to work with people that I like and feel like, you know, if something's going to happen to me that my days were worth it, I want to do something with you. I'm asking you to go on a journey with me. Um, and that was really the moment when I was like, you know what? I'm never going to have another chance in my life to work with my best friend. You know, like I, I have to do this. He wants this. He's ready to do it. And so he was the one who really pushed me to take that plunge. Um, and in that sense, I think I was very lucky because if he hadn't done that, I don't know if I would have ever had the, the conviction to, to make a leap like that. So that is so that story is so relevant, obviously, to our podcast. So can you go? Um, he calls you up. What are the early days like? Did you know it was going to be Gamer Sensei? Were you brainstorming over, you know, a beer? Oh, this is what it's going to be like. Like, can you kind of tell us the story of the early early days? days of a startup are crazy because you have no idea what you're i mean you have like you basically you know and particularly this was a as an unusual founding story i think because we didn't have an idea rohan had an experience and he said i want to do something you know join me right and i said oh sure i'll join you now feels like a great time but that was really it you know what i mean that was really it was more a decision for two people to work together rather than it was to build a specific business although i actually think you know that retrospectively worked out very well in our favor because as i said i think the co-founding relationship is one of the most important relationships in business and unintentionally we started with a great co-founder relationship you know without realizing it but yeah early stages are really really hard because you don't you, you're guessing you're trying to figure out what you might like to do um you know you also don't really know what ideas are good and what ideas aren't good because you're sort of testing them right and that's tough 
Um, and then also, you know, and this can't be understated, you don't have money, right? Like you don't have a lot of money to pursue the idea you're doing. And, you know, I hate to say it, but it's very difficult to build a very valuable business without a lot of cash. And so you also need to not only be settling on an idea, but thinking about the venture round and how you're going to go and raise venture capital quickly, right? Because you have to raise money to actually have a shot at building a successful business today. I, I really believe that there are exceptions. There are some types of businesses that can scale without, but for a lot of the things that I wanted to do, you know, you need venture capital. And so, yeah, those early days are like, they're weird. You know, to be fair, they're also very exciting because they're full of a lot of possibility, right? Like you could do any idea you want, you know, that might be cool. I'm into that. Maybe we should make it all about, you know, this thing I'm interested in. Um, but like I said, for me, you know, what ended up happening for me is that, you know, I had this interest in games and gaming, you know, as I was telling you about, like, I, I wasn't good at it. And I just, I knew, I knew if a business like this existed and was a good commercial properly built business, I would be using it as a customer. And that just really gave me the conviction to say, like, let's do this. Let's go into games. Let's build this type of thing together. And, you know, funnily enough, it was probably tied to some something I did after management consulting very briefly. I worked at a nonprofit in Japan, um, which was a really cool experience and in many ways far more formative for me than I think I realized at the time. You know, at the time I was doing it because it sounded like really fun, you know, go work at a nonprofit in Japan before business school, get international experience, help people. But retrospectively, you know, the founder of that nonprofit, it was a company called ISL, um, which is still around today. And the founder of that, a guy called Tomonoda, had some sort of saying, and I'm paraphrasing because it's from the Japanese, but it's basically like, you know, what leaders do is they take steps where, you know, no other people can see. And, you know, I, I think that idea at the time, I remember reading, but I don't, I doesn't really, you know, whatever, come on, it's one of those silly leadership quotes, you know, but retrospectively, it really fit with how I feel the early phases of a startup should feel like, which is, you know what the end game should look like, right? Like you can easily imagine a world where games are super popular, where people are playing them competitively. And so naturally, if you have coaches for baseball, like you're going to have coaches for this, right? So like you can see that end state pretty clearly and you can have conviction around the end state. You can say, I love games. Games are growing every year. We're going to get there, right? The thing that... um the thing that you can't see is how you connect where you are today with that end state, right? Like it's not a clear path how that happens. And in fact, there's probably paths the world takes where those things diverge pretty substantially and you end up in a different place, you know. But if you have to see that end state and you have that conviction, then it's just about taking those steps that you can't really, that you're sort of just guessing at. Like, well, maybe it starts like this. Maybe it starts with a website or something. I don't know. But you're guessing, but you're constantly looking with your eyes towards that big end goal and you eat with each step you're saying, are we getting a little bit closer to the world that I saw that looks like this? I don't know if that makes sense or if that's helpful, but. Maybe um, then a follow-up question to that is, uh, so you have the idea, which was close to your heart. It was solving a problem that you had. One of the biggest issues I tend to see, we've had almost thousands of startups pass through startup funding event is the market research it's not even not only is it one of the most common problems it's also one of the things that is really hard to explain how people should do it i think it took me like four businesses before we just like started understanding what market research actually meant which was properly seeing that there was a need and that by just creating the product people would buy it right away and if they don't buy it right away then probably the market isn't ready or something like that but I would like to kind of hear your experience, you know, how did, you came up with the idea, but how did you know that this was going to sell? Did you put it out, test it somehow and, you know, suddenly got a ton of demand? Well, you know, let's be more abstract, I think, about the answer here, because it's not like you don't really know anything is ever going to sell. Right. Like you have conviction, you know, that the idea is good. But fundamentally, the question I think a lot of people miss in entrepreneurship is, they do know there's a customer out there, right? Like they do know there's a customer out there. And oftentimes, like I said, and they probably think they might be the customer and they have friends and they know people like them. So yeah, there's a customer. The question is, is the business venture scale, 
right? Like I could have an idea to make bespoke teacups painted with, you know, traditional, you know, rosette printings of, you know, I'm making it up, right? And like, there's probably a market for that. And there are probably people who buy it and are super passionate about it. And it might even be a pretty good business. You know, I might even be able to sell a couple hundred teacups, a couple thousand teacups a year and build a good life off of teacups, right? And sorry, this is not trivializing tea. It's just this, you know, an example I'm throwing out there. But that doesn't mean that this needs venture capital and tons of scale. I don't need to go buy a teacup production factory, hire a graphic design team to print my teacups, right? And I think that's oftentimes what people miss is, yes, there's a customer, but does the customer justify a venture scale of investment? And, you know, the... The really good piece here, and this is where I think the market research comes in, is this is where it's up to you as the entrepreneur to answer that question. And the hard thing is if it's truly a new idea, it's really difficult, right? Like it's really difficult to show if the customers are there because if the customers were already there, you wouldn't have an idea. It would already be an existing business. You know what I mean? So it's tough, right? But that's where you get clever about looking at proxy businesses, right? So things that are similar to your current business in other industries. That's where you get clever about looking at the industry as a whole and how big it is that you're playing in and what, you know, you just kind of like a bottom-up sizing about, well, how many people do I think might like this? And if it's this many, does it work? And if it's half of that, does it work? You get a sense of tolerances for the scale. Um, and, you know, really, like I said, I think that's the step where people are building business, where they sort of fall down a little bit. It's a good idea, and it actually could be a business, but it's not a business that justifies venture scale, but people jump into it anyway because, you know, again, if you're looking in the very, very short term, right? If you're looking one or two steps ahead, it might look like a good idea. But if you sort of take the advice I'm saying, which is no, look to the very end of the spectrum, right? Like look to the very end of the spectrum, look at like what the world is like 10 years from now, you know, is it dominated by teacup manufacturing conglomerates? If it's not, or if you think that's unlikely, then think about the path you're taking for the current. And that, by the way, that doesn't mean don't do your business. It might just mean don't do it as a venture scale business because there's better ways to build it. I, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Lova? Sorry, I feel like I moved around a little there. So partially it does. Uh, I guess the question for me was more specifically to your story as well. How did you know this was going to sell? And how did you? That, that story was actually really relevant. Uh, it explains a lot. But uh, again, I learned from stories. So how did you know this was potentially, I guess, going to work for you? I guess you did imagine this world where people needed coaches and everything in 10 years. So it makes sense. Um, how did you then convince somebody to go into uh, to invest in you? Uh, especially, I think you started this like six, seven years ago. Can't imagine it was like super popular back yeah, then. Yeah, I think we were how one of the earlier esports startups to get a bunch of venture funding actually, um, you know, which is pretty crazy. Um, but um, yeah, so how did we do it specifically? Well, let me answer, how did we know it was a venture scale idea? We did the research I'm talking about. So we looked at like, okay, is there a market for coaching in baseball? How big is it? Okay, that's pretty big. How many people play baseball? How many people play games? You know, like we did things like that, right? So that, just to close that off, that's how you answer that question, right? Um, how you raise capital is a totally different story and probably a podcast in itself because raising capital is very, very, very difficult. I think it's the two hardest phases in building a company are right at the beginning. It's raising capital and it's acquiring your early users. I think those are the, and I mean real early users, not like friends and family who like you pressure to come use your product, like real early users. Those are the two hardest parts and they come right at the beginning, which is why I think so many startups don't make it out of the seed stage. They fail because they have to do their two hardest, highest, their hardest hurdles, their highest hurdles earliest. Um, so how we raise money, you know, and this is going to give some general advice to people now, you know, about how you raise venture capital. So first of all, like I said, make sure you have the team in place to raise. So, you know, again, I think it's very hard to get given money as a one person show right? It's far more credible to get money when you have the team. So going back to my checklist of three things, you know, to do a startup, right? Now, seriousness and team, make sure the team is there. You have to make sure the team is there. And if it's not, like, you don't even, don't even try to go get money right now because your odds of success aren't that great. You know, go look around. Find, so make sure you have your team in place. Um, then 
the next thing that you probably want to do once you have it is and you've done the basics like got your pitch deck together and everything and you know built out a story that you find compelling and this goes to the seriousness piece right like if you're not actually um you know if you're not actually like uh you know serious enough to design a deck and test it and really think about what's being communicated and do the research don't do the company it's never going to happen right so you have that deck and everything in place then you know venture is a game of long slow effort i don't think there's any other way to describe it right at least particularly for people who are raising for your first startup it gets a lot easier with subsequent startups but your first startup is hard to do because you don't have any track record of building startups. So convincing somebody to give you a lot of money is really difficult. And so the way you do it is twofold. One is you just talk to everyone. You follow up every connection. You know, I I think I was pretty introverted for most of my life and raising money turned me into an extrovert. I know that's crazy to say, but like it literally forced me to get comfortable inserting myself into conversations, bringing things up, pushing myself, promoting myself, right? Because otherwise you just, you don't get enough connections. And then, so you start, you kind of, and there's the great thing about VC today is there's all these ways to get in touch with VC funds, right? They have like, you know, idea submission competitions, right? You know, they have, a lot of them will have contact information on a website. They'll do pitch days and other things. There are incubators that you can go through. So you're driving all of these angles, right? You're trying to literally do everything that you can do to get in front of venture capitalists. Um, and then once you're in front of the venture capitalists, I think a secret I have and a recommendation I have is never leave the conversation with a venture capitalist empty handed. And by that, I mean, like, it doesn't matter if they don't, they like, they're probably not going to invest. Let's be realistic. That's why I have to have these conversations. So ask any venture capitalist you talk to at the end to introduce you and your company to two other people that they know basically, right? Like turn that one connection into two connections. And that actually adds a lot of value for two reasons. One is now you've doubled the number of people you know in the space. You've turned what was potentially a dead end because that person doesn't invest into two new leads that you can follow up. That's the first. But the second is, you know, and I think venture investors like to get the opinions of their friends, right? They like to, and particularly if they're going to invest in a company and they're maybe even considering you more seriously than you realize, they like to know what other people in the industry might think. They like to, you know, it's very rare that a round is done by itself. There's a lead and then other people follow. And typically investors who lead your round like to invite other investors that they know into the round. So it also makes it easier for the person you're talking to to invest because it gets you in front of people they might know, he or she might know, right? You know, to have a dialogue and, you know, further vet your idea. So I really like that as a recommendation. And the last thing you do is you create urgency. So and I think this is a crucial skill that entrepreneurs sometimes miss is why should a venture capitalist give you money now, right? Like, why should they give you money now? Because they will get more information if they wait. It's true, right? They will absolutely get more information if they wait. They'll learn more about the market. You'll do more work on the product, right? Like, it's just better for them to wait. The incentives for VCs are to wait. So for them to invest in you, for that to be worth it, they need a reason why the investment has to be now. Um, because otherwise they will wait. And so you as the entrepreneur should be looking for things like time sensitive things in your business that need to be delivered. And you should be communicating those to the VCs to explain, look, the reason why you need to give me money now is your money will be worth a lot more if you give it to me now when than later. And it could be a key hire, like this person's ready to join now. I don't know if they'll be ready to join in two months. It could be, you know, a key opportunity to show a prototype. Like, look, there's this public convention. If we have it there, we'll be ready. If not, we have to wait a year and who knows what happens then, right? But you should be looking for those opportunities and really communicating them because that's what catalyzes capital rounds in my opinion, right? Like you you not only have the team in place, right? You not only have a great pitch deck and you're not only talking to everybody you meet, but you're very clear that the time to do the business is now and you're constantly reminding people that funding now is better than funding later. Um, I don't know, is that helpful? And that's sort of what we did for Gamer Sense. I mean, I can give specific examples, but fundamentally, that's the path we took. I probably did not realize that was how we were taking the path, you know, so specifically, right? We figured it out. You know, like I didn't have these rules of thumb and everything. We figured it out as we were going through it. But that's what, looking back, I would say I developed the skills from that opportunity that then allowed me to, you know, raise for other businesses. Looking back, was it worth it getting venture capital in or were you... Uh 
or was it better to maybe just do it yourself with your co-founder? Because uh, that's also a question that gets popped up a lot. Should you be giving away equity or not? Oh, so the equity conversation is a really tricky conversation, right? Because, um, you know, like it's your business, you know what I mean? Like, so if you give away, be, but I, I think the the reality is like, and this is what every entrepreneur will say, or a lot of entrepreneurs will say, you know, zero, a hundred percent of nothing is nothing, right? Like, you know, and you need, this is what I'm saying about, you need a team, you need co-founders, you want people to help you do this. It's really tough to do it alone. So in principle, I think, you know, you should, you know, it, giving away equity isn't that big of a deal provided you're giving it to get people to help you grow the business and who are really going to contribute to the business. Um, the question of whether or not to take VC money, I, I mean, I think it's silly. I think you have to take money. I, I think very bluntly, I think that there's a bit of survivorship bias for the people who don't take money, right? They either got very lucky, right? Or they had very specific ideas that were low capital intensity and so really didn't require VC. And that goes back to that market research state. My teacup idea might be absolutely amazing and I might be able to make a million dollars a year off of it because these teacups sell for a thousand dollars each, you know, but it's not a capital intensive industry. It doesn't need venture capital to get there. So don't do it. Right. But I do think most companies today need the capital. Realistically, most ideas you have, you need funding to achieve. You need to actually build something and building something takes time and cash. Right. Um, I will say, too, that people often underestimate how valuable VCs are in helping you build your business. Like, I think sometimes people think VCs are just like, like they give you money and then they're a problem because you have to tell them how the business is going. And that's not true. Good venture capitalists can add real material value to your company. They can do it because they can recognize business situations you're in and give you advice. They can do it because they can network you with other businesses they have relationships with and make introductions that you otherwise wouldn't know. They can do it because they can help they can help you secure future funding rounds to keep the business going because once they put money in the business, they're in the same boat as you, right? Their reputation is levered against it. So, and I, I could keep going, but they actually add a lot of value. I think sometimes entrepreneurs don't always know how to access that value or don't necessarily want to access that value. But this goes back more to sort of the style of entrepreneurship I'm promoting, which is like, you know, collaborative, like use the resources around you, get people to help because the fundamental thing you're missing in entrepreneurship is resources. You don't have enough people. You don't have enough time. You don't have enough money, right? So if there's these people who can help you, these other resources out there, take advantage of everything you can because it's overcoming the resource gap that lets you grow your business. Yeah, I like that. Um, and it's true. My experience with venture capitalists was that they were usually multiple people with different backgrounds and expertises, mostly corporate, big companies, even startups, and they can you know, give you that expertise like HR or something. Uh, and it's also, I can say one more thing, people, I think, you know, like you're, you're sort of with venture capitalists hiring your own bosses, right? Like, so that's a very special thing to be able to do, right? Like, it's like, imagine if you could choose who you worked for, right? Literally, like you were hiring the person you were going to work for. Yeah, there's, you're still working for them. It's a little bit of an unappealing, and I'm exaggerating here a little bit, but fundamentally, you know, VCs do have a lot of control in these businesses, um, right? But also it's a great opportunity because you can pick people you respect. You can pick people you know are smart. You can pe pick people you know who learn from. And so I think better entrepreneurs who found more companies later in their life, um, they understand that. And they actually, one of the things they use their successful track record is, is not necessarily to raise more money, but to have more control over who they raise the money from. Mm, that's a good one. Um, so, sorry, I keep going on this one example. No, go for it. I hope I'm again. like, I hope I'm giving you the material you need, you know, because I could talk about anything. We got to talk about the book itself. I really want to talk about book and more present day stuff too, because that's awesome. Super relevant. Uh, I think the last question that I still have around the Gamer Sensei period is uh, at the end of the day, what you were creating was a coaching type of business. Um, why not just grow it with sales? Great question. Great question. And this goes to, you know, the thing I was saying about the end state. Is it a venture? Is this business because is this a venture scale business that you're trying to build? Right. So like you know, let me be clear, like you could probably, I mean, like look at, you know, gym instructors in your local town, right? Like 
plenty of those people have successful independent businesses where they have client and they don't need any venture capital to do it. The question is, do you want to build a venture scale business? And in our case, we saw a world where, you know, there would be a single destination where everybody would go to get the best quality coaching around games, right? And that felt like something that needed capital and resources to achieve. So again, it's not to say, I think people, like the question of when to raise venture capital or not, like, yeah, it's there are plenty of businesses that don't require VC. I, I really believe that. Um, but I think most businesses that people consider and talk about really do, if they're really being ambitious with it and they really want that big end state, venture capital is probably required to get there. That's That's a very clear answer. Thank you. Um, okay, so then we move on kind of into the next, I would say, almost era of your uh, <laughs> career. Uh, so you're doing Gamer Sensei. It's going. Um, did you sell that business at one point? And, and it, eventually, it eventually it sold. Um, it sold uh, to Corsair, actually, which is a big hardware manufacturer. So, um, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, keep going, Lova. Yeah. So how did that go? And most important question what was next and what was your mental state like after it was sold? Yeah. So I actually ended up, you know, though I was still involved with gamer sense. I sort of left, you know, the day to day of the company before it had sold. Um, and that is actually really, interesting. that's because I'm a very idea driven person, right? Like for me, and this is actually a really good talk about what happens in startups and startup life cycle, right? At a certain point, you get to a point in a startup where the challenge doesn't become what is the idea. The challenge doesn't become who's going to build the idea. The challenge doesn't even really become sort of like, you know, like what is the product, right? The challenge becomes scale and scalability, right? And particularly for B2C consumers, this is, I think, the third hardest part. I said the first hardest part is raising money, then getting your early users. The next hardest part is getting across these scale inflection curves, right? Like getting a business to really, you know, blast past every milestone and have a trillion users, right? And I think as a person, I'm more of an idea guy. You know, I really like the early stage. I like the flexibility. And I like, and it goes back to like this whole thing about, you know, I said at Hasbro, I was creating, right? I really like the feel of creating. I, I personally like the feel of optimizing less, like optimizing a business less. And so, you know, I had an awesome opportunity where the Gamer Sense had closed a huge capital round. It had an amazing team, like literally like an absolutely unbelievable team. Like that business was going to like it was at a new stage in its life and it gave me some opportunity to go look at you know doing something else and so the next thing i did was you know this genji business which has been very successful as well i'm very lucky to say which was data analytics for esports and that is a similar you know insight in the sense i was i think i was reading about moneyball or you know i'd read the book or seen the movie or i can't even remember but like i you know i was interested in sort of saber metrics and assessment for sports right and I was thinking, wow, this is like a big industry. You know, and I'm kind of, you know, sorry, I'm kind of a nerdy guy. Like, I like numbers and math. I'm like, this is so cool that, you know, you can predict, like, who a great baseball player is going to be, you know, just by looking at some numbers. I was like, well, wait a minute here. How accurate are those numbers you're really predicting with sabermetrics, right? Because you don't know the wind speed that a ball is traveling at. You don't know the exact velocity and angle that a bat is swung at. You don't really know the deformation that the ball undergoes when it makes contact with the wood. You don't know the miles per hour it travels at to a high degree of, you know, to a, a you know, a very high degree of accuracy, right? Like, and yet we all recognize that analyzing statistics for sports is super meaningful. And I was thinking, well, games, like games are going to have a humongous opportunity, a humongous opportunity to, um, for statistics in games and game design, because fundamentally, like you have the perfect information. It's the best case because games are simulated worlds. So you do know, you know, if you if you imagine a baseball video game, right? Like you do know the speed the ball is traveling at. You do know the deformation with the bat. You do know the angle because it's an entirely, it's all in zeros and ones right there for you. So, you know, I had this other thought, which is I love analysis and I love things like this. You know, this is going to be a big thing in games. Let's go and do something like this in games. And so, you know, I ended up scaling that business with, again, an incredible group of co-founders. I mean, just so much. Again, the, the number one thing I think to take away from building businesses is who you work with and who you build them with, because 
they, I feel like they're the reason I've been successful, you know, more than anything else, right? But um, we got an amazing group of co-founders behind that business, and you know, we built it out. And that was actually a different business. We focused more on business to business. If you think of Gamer Sensei as being B two C, this was more a B two B business, which was a new experience for me. It was very interesting because you have different challenges like sales cycles and client relationships and other things you have to solve. But fundamentally, it, this you know, this business was coming from the same insight as everything I've done, which is I love games. And I can start to see what the world looks like when games are more serious and taken more seriously. And I just pick the pieces of that world that I think are really interesting and try to go and make them. But so your transition was almost right away. There wasn't like a gap of a couple of months where you were just thinking of ideas. You know, like you always go through some transition period, right, where you're working on different things and you're testing. Because as I said, that's like an exciting part, um, you know, in your life as a, as a business builder, right? Like you want to have other ideas. You want to contemplate other things, um, you know, but, you know, no, I, I, I tend to move pretty quickly. I think historically, not that I've done, you know, 100 startups or something, but I'm somebody who like... I want to move quickly between ideas because, again, as I said, now the bias is now, right? Like it goes back to that first point. Why would you wait? And because the other thing is, people can overconsider things in the space. I really see this a lot with like entrepreneurs, who are like, I got this great idea, but I just wish this would happen. Or I got this great idea, but I just wish, you know, I could convince this. And it goes back to like, you just, you need to start because guess what? People don't remember all the businesses you started and failed, right? Like this conversation isn't about, I have lots of companies that didn't work that I've thought about doing, that I've done pitch decks for, right? That I've like tried. I have a ton. I have a ton, right? But it, it looks, it creates this sort of bias of success, which is like, it looks like you're moving rapidly from one idea to another. In reality, you're doing a lot, you're testing a lot, and you're just talking about the things that work. But that testing, intelligent mindset of needing to try things, quickly learn, throw stuff out that doesn't work, the laboratory mindset, I think is really important to success. So if you're so in in the day to day starting the businesses and stuff like that how did you end up becoming uh you know teaching about esports why write a book about esports how did you end up there great question so this is a totally separate thread in my life here basically um but i uh you know i mentioned i like to create things right and i've always always wanted to write like I just love writing I love I actually like try to write books I've tried to write books like since high school like literally like like different I mean not like books about esports but like fantasy books and sci-fi books like I've just always loved to write and um you know I had this experience where as I started to have success in games and gaming um you know believe it or not like there are colleges too there's so many students who are interested. I think we're not talking about about games is how it's so driven by you know kids and students today like just so it's such a young skewing industry right and so if you think of what's happening on college campuses it's a ton of gaming there's most college students today are passionate about games and play games so colleges are businesses they're responsive to their students needs so all of a sudden you have colleges saying hey i can get enrollment in a course about games or a course about esports you know, let's try this out. And that means they need people to teach it. And so I was lucky enough to get asked by a college called Becker College um, to teach there. And uh, it was a really flattering moment because my wife is a college professor. My dad is a professor. I think I kind of have some professor, you know, genes in me. And I was like, all right, I'm going to go do this. It's going to be great. And I had this vision of teaching being so easy, Lova. Like I thought it was just going to be like, I'm going to show up. I'm an expert because I've done stuff in the space. You know, there's, I'm just going to assign some readings and talk and bring donuts and everyone will like me. And, you know, unfortunately, I realized two things right away. One is teaching is very, very, very hard, like really hard. Um, but two is because I was teaching esports, I realized there was nothing to assign. Like there was just nothing to assign. Like I'd signed up. And I thought it was going to be super easy. I would go on Amazon. I'd just like, you know, bam, bam, do these books. And there was just, and I was like, oh, what have I done? You know, this is going to be really bad, right? Because now I'm a teacher without anything to teach. And so that then also, you know, I think credit, I guess a little bit of credit. Like I then was like, well, then wait a minute. Like if there's not a book written about esports that you think is really great and you'd want to assign, William 
you've wanted to write a book for a long time. You know, maybe you should write a book about esports. And that was the story for writing the book. And funnily enough, you know, a lot of the skills I had in venture capital actually kind of apply to writing books about esports too. You know what I mean? Because you have to get an agent and then you have to get a publisher and that's a pitch process, right? That's a difficult pitch process where most people reject you. And so I think the same fortitude to like handle rejection, be like, it's still a good idea, I'm gonna do it. But also the same persistence, the connectivity, right? All of that stuff benefited me. And, you know, yeah, I ended up luckily enough producing this book, which was really selfish. It was basically a book so then I could have something to assign in my classes. <laughs> But, you know, it ended up, um, I, I, you know, honestly, I'm really proud of it because I think it's a really definitive take on the industry. And I think it brings a lot of concepts and ideas um, to the space because it's not it's not just about like what are esports. It's, it is a history. It is what does things look like now. But it has things like frameworks in the book that try to predict what's going to happen, which I think is, you know, probably one of my favorite things in it. I'm a framework guy and I'm lucky that I put something like that out there. Uh, before we dive deeper into like the frameworks and book and stuff like that, in this day and age, why go through the pitching process? Why not just publish it yourself? Great question. Wow, that's like a really, really good question. And again, it goes back to the 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 thing I you know was saying earlier, which is what's the outcome you want? What's the scale you want here? Because it would have been very easy for me to write a book you know, make a cover, drop it on Amazon and say, go well. And a lot of people do that. I think you can be very, very successful self-publishing. Um, the thing is, you know, I really wanted to write a book that, you know, but I also knew what it looked like because I had friends who'd done self-publishing. And, you know, I wasn't like, because I'd had this author life cycle, I'd, you know, attended workshops on what happens if you self-publish. And I knew two things. I knew it's a ton of work to self-publish because you also have to do all the marketing yourself. Like you can write an amazing book and have the most gorgeous cover in the world, you know, and put it on Amazon. And how is anyone going to find it? Like no one's looking for, you know, your specific book. Right. And certainly even if they are, it's the SEO and it is going to be so bad on Amazon. Like no one's ever going to click through enough pages to find it. So I knew it was a ton of work to market. And that was something I really didn't want to do. I really didn't want to do too much marketing for books. But I also knew that, you know, publishing would help get the book in other mediums, like, you know, for example, colleges and universities. And a big thing I really wanted was to have the book actually help people learn, right? Like I really wanted to use, have this be a, something that could maybe be a little foundational for the industry to help people discover and improve. Um, and I knew that if it was a self-published book, it's going to be hard to go to like, you know, like, you know, you know, university like Harvard or something and be like, yo, I self-published this. It's, you know, there's a credibility piece that you get from going through traditional publishing. Um, and that also, again, like I said, VCs add value publishers. They have great feedback. They help connect you. They can, you know, do all these other things like foreign rights and everything. So I knew I wanted to have a publisher for it to get all of these benefits because the, that was the outcome I was aiming for. I wanted to have a book that was read and read by specific segments of the market. If I, for example, had just wanted to write a book to write because I was truly passionate about writing and I just wanted to finish a story and then get it out there so someone could find it. Yeah, don't go get a publisher. Self-publish. It's great if you don't care about what the end result looks like and it's more the process for you. And a lot of writers, I think, can be like that way. Um, then... Self-publishing can be good. Or conversely, if you really want to market your own book and you want to aggressively promote it and you're prepared to do that, then by all means, take that path. That's a great path. Um, I don't know if this is helpful, Lova, but yeah, that's sort of why I, I made that decision. It's literally you're showing the difference between venture capital and starting your own business with no venture capital, except we're talking about books, but it's literally the same almost. Uh, very interesting. Um, what... What are some of the things about the book? Because when I saw the book of esports, at the, you know, on first glance, I did not really imagine it to be like a handbook for your lectures. Obviously, I knew that you did that, so it would make sense. But what was the thought process on, on you know, creating the chapters, creating the curriculum within your book? Um, why that? What is it that you wanted to share with this book? Um, that people don't catch on first glance. Well, see, oh, good question. So that's kind of stealthy too. Like you're right. It doesn't sort of, it's not designed to read like a textbook. And that's because nobody wants to read a textbook, 
right? Like, and this sort of goes to like knowing your audiences. I did want to write something that was textbook like, but I really didn't want to write textbook because textbook is boring, right? Like, it's like, it's like nobody's, no, I mean, there probably are people, but I think like it's rare that somebody goes to bed at night and they're like, oh, I'm going to read chapter seven of this, you know, like microbiology textbook. It's thrilling, you know, or you don't see people on, you know, you don't look, go to airport bookstores, right? And see like, you know, introduction to physics 101, you know, like, it's just I wanted so I tried to think a lot about how you would lay out a structure that could f serve as a foundation for teaching and education, but um, but didn't f like felt like a book that would be fun and casual to read. And so the secret to that I think was narratives. You know what a textbook is missing is conflict, right? There's no there's no na there's no like hero or villain in a textbook. There's no rise and fall. It's just facts that are stated. And the thing I tried to do with this book is I tried to anchor different chapters and different sections around different protagonists, right? So like that could be a company like Riot Games and their push to create, you know, League of Legends. It could be individuals like people who maybe founded a pro team or started the first ever varsity, you know, esports program, right? But I tried to create some narratives so you could care about people. And then, you know, believe it or not, there was a real question for how to organize this. And there were all sorts of difference. And it turned out, you know, it was actually this goes back to the value of a publisher and an editor and people like they had this solution to just organize it essentially chronologically, right? Like try to stack things. So now your narrative can feel like it's building. You can meet people earlier and then they will come back later after they've done something important. They will be more important later in the story. So, you know, like there's a build. And so I'm not saying this is a book full of, you know, like life stories and anything. It is, it's a book designed to teach you about the industry. But I think like people seem to enjoy reading it. I think one of the reasons why it's fun to read is the chapters give you a reason to keep reading. You like want to know what's going to happen. You're like, wow, you know, like is, you know, like how, how are these riot guys going to figure out, you know, going free to play? Like, you know, what, how, how's that business model going to work? Like, and what are they risking? And, you know, how is this person's story about going pro you know, really like, I don't know. I think that's why the book has, you know, some, some more fun to read and why maybe it doesn't feel like a textbook, even though it's very much designed to teach. What are some of the things nowadays that you're working on, whether it be the book or the companies you're working in that, that are interesting to share for our audience? Oh man. Well, probably two things. I mean, one is I'm super, super excited about the work I continue to do with Genji. Um, you know, that business was acquired by Esports Entertainment Group, which is one of the publicly traded companies for esports on the NASDAQ. And that's unlocked, you know, tons of amazing resources and opportunities for us to continue to grow the business. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's not a lot specifically that I can share about that. Um, other than, you know, I'm really, really excited to basically be continuing this idea of data and the power of data in games and using that to drive a ton of value and value for a public company, right? Where, you know, there's now real, you talk about scale and opportunities for scale. There's just so many more resources now that we can use to solve even bigger and bigger problems. So I'm really excited about that. Um, I'm also actually really excited about, you know, the, the podcast that I do. So I have this podcast business of esports. Um, that's just, super fun to be involved in because that's another thing where um you know it started as basically a hobby between me and the co-founder Paul Dawalibi and you know it has um I think just because we had a great rapport we kept doing it and it's grown a ton in scale it's now probably I think the the most authoritative podcast about the business side of the industry that's out there um and that's just fun for me because I learn a lot like every time I do a podcast episode and we have a new guest or we discuss new news stories I feel like I get smarter about the industry because I have perspectives and things I, you know, didn't hear or learn about, you know, and more broadly, like outside of what I'm doing, I'm excited for what esports are going to do. Like every year we get record breaking viewership numbers. Every year the game publishers have record breaking sales that get published. Every year there are new games that come out that might be the big new marquee esport. It's like imagine being a sports fan. And like every two to three years, an entirely new sport came out. And that might be the coolest, most best sport of all time, like even better than all the sports before it. Like, it's really exciting. Like, it's a fun space to be a part of and to engage with. And so I just I'm just excited to see where the industry is going to go, because I'm one small part of it. And the stuff I do is one small part of it. But as a whole, I really believe I'm lucky enough to be part of 
I think a trend in how humans are human society is going to change. It might seem silly to say that games are going to be, you know, like um, the future of humanity. But I literally like go back to thing you said about Facebook and their meaning. I mean, the roads are starting to connect. We're coming to digitized worlds. Um, how fast we get there and how much we choose to digitize are up for question. But that is where we are going as a society. And I think, ironically, you think that that's a dehumanizing trend. You think that it makes us less human and more robotic. But everything I've talked about in this has been about connectivity, connecting people, right? The power. I think it's actually deeply humanizing. It feels counterintuitive, but I think the more technology infiltrates our lives, it doesn't have to separate us. It really can bring us together and give us new ways to connect. How realistic is a future um, like Ready Player One? I don't know if you saw that movie. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, like it's super realistic, like very, very realistic. Um, and for people who don't know, you know, Ready Player One is like, you know, essentially a purely simulated world, right? You know, that these people live in. Um, and the other analogy that's often given for this is the Matrix, right? Like that's probably the more classic example where like, you know, there's this entirely simulated fantasy world. You know the plot of the Matrix. I need to explain it to you anyway. Um, but I think that world is very, very realistic. How fast we get there, I think, is the big question. Um, because I don't think it's like tomorrow we're all plugging our brains into computers and uploading our consciousness. Um, I, that could be hundreds of years away, you know, although I think it's much sooner than we think. I don't think this is like 200 plus years. I think it's much quicker. Um, but we're on a path where like ask anybody who's played a big simulated world like an MMO, like World of Warcraft, right? Like ask them what they did. They made friends. They planned and strategized. They went on grand battles. They maybe even fell in love. The number of people who've fallen in love in MMOs is crazy and gotten married, right? Like, and that like World of Warcraft is like 20 years old, right? Like that started a long time ago and that wasn't even the first MMO, you know? So like we're at a stage in our life where all of the things that you see people doing in Ready Player One are being done online they're just being done at a much lower level of fidelity and simulation right like there's not tactile feedback it doesn't look as cool as it does in the movie but sort of this stuff is already happening to some extent um the interesting question is how fast does it happen right like how quickly do we go there and more importantly what are the stops along the way because I don't think it's like a straight shot between like you wake up one morning like I said you're plugged there's going to be a bunch of benchmark technologies that we anchor at for a while that define that generation of consumption and a good example of this is um is vr like i think vr is probably one of the next benchmark technologies that we're going to anchor around and have whole brands and companies and identities built around vr and then there'll be another benchmark technology and there'll be a little bit of a reset and things will go away but we'll get close each time we'll be getting closer and closer to this future um, and I think it's, like I said, I think it doesn't actually need to be a scary future because the thing I believe is I don't think it's going to be a matrix scenario where we just absolutely delete the physical and forget it exists, right? I, I just, I, I, or if we did that, it'd take a very long time to get there. And I, I'm not sure people are willing to go there all the way, but I do think what will happen is we will start to make these fundamental choices about what is better done digitally and what is better done physically. And we'll just start to choose to do more and more digitally to the point where, you know, maybe sports, like quite seriously, like if you can have a really accurate simulation of baseball, why would you play real baseball? You know, like, wouldn't you just go online? You can play the game without any rain. You know what I mean? You can play it against anyone in the world, right? You know what I mean? Like you don't have to have any fan can sit in the stadium, you know, like we'll start to make more and more choices and trade-offs about what might be physical and what might be digital. And but there'll still be a physical world and it will still be important. It will just be overlaid by a digital narrative. I have to say I uh, agree because we had, I think it was episode 28 or 27, something like that. We had uh, a world a record holder for long drive, which is, it's like golf, except, you know, different thing. They use golf sticks to, to go as far as possible, to hit the ball as far as possible. And, um, he was telling on a podcast how he had a sim like a simulated environment in his studio at home it was like 10k or something like that and he just kept practicing there uh all because he lives in germany when it was raining and stuff like that and then he broke the world record 
furthest ball um, during competition or something like that. So, yeah, I do see a future like that. People underestimate, you know, the power for technology, I think, already to make so many things in our lives better and to get you better. The thing is, it doesn't need to be like that's a good example of something where it doesn't need to be the digital replacing the physical. The digital is complementing the physical. Right. It's like in this case, it's training you. And then when you go to do the physical thing, it's way easier. And probably it was way better to train digitally because in that example you gave, the guy was raining and the guy couldn't go outside, you know. So they got more training time through a digital experience. And because the digital experience was good, it mapped very well into a physical analog. We are uh, nearing the end. But before we get to the end, um, I would like kind of to ask you, what, what are some closing thoughts or some things that you didn't share yet that you'd like to share uh, with our audience? <sighs> I mean, that's a really good question. Um, So closing thoughts. So I guess the first closing thought I would say is like take esports very, very seriously, right? Like if you're not somebody who knows a lot about the space or, you know, maybe you're you've probably definitely heard about it before. I'm not the first person telling you about it, but you've kind of dismissed it or like take a look at it and what's actually going on in the space. Because if you're a parent, it's going to matter because it's what your kids are doing. If you're a business leader, it's going to matter because it's a demographic for you to access and it's an important market trend. You know, if you're like, as we talked about, even if you're a college professor, you might get asked to teach a course. So like this is something going on in the world that you should probably know about and you shouldn't have. I'm not saying you need to become an expert, but you should have familiarity with it. And so and more importantly, you shouldn't dismiss it as like silly kids playing online. It really is an important moment in how people interact and it's really changing how people connect. It's the birth of true digital competition, right? So like, and that is, that sounds important because it is important. So that's one thing, like, please look at esports, and it's important. The second thing is if you're maybe an entrepreneur, you know, listening to this podcast, I guess, you know, think about the stuff I said. I mean, obviously I've had a very, my type of experience. I've only gone through the things and the challenges that I've gone through. The stuff I've learned you know, I mean, you talk to anybody, they all have different narratives and different advice. But I guess this is my advice. Think about it. You know, think about the three steps I said about, you know, being ready to start a company, right? Think about in particular the importance of the co-founders and that great co-founding team. You know, think about how hard the different steps are and know that if the beginning feels really difficult in the business, it's okay. It's because it is the hardest part, you know, like, but I guess, you know, there's, I'd like people maybe think about that, maybe get some lessons for me about entrepreneurship. Um, and then the last thing I would say is, yeah, more importantly, the bigger message, if you just somehow are not not interested in entrepreneurship and you're not interested in esports at all, which I would argue like you should be because they're very important. But if you're not like just think more broadly about how technology is coming into our lives and what technology is doing and how, like I said, we don't have to be so scared of technology. It can be a very scary and you know dehumanizing force, but it can be extremely positive. Um, and think more about, you know, how the good ways that technology can bring us together, because I, I really do think that's one of the big forces that it has in our lives. And I hope that's the direction it takes. I, uh, absolutely love all the things we've discussed. I, I did not even expect how much we discussed the whole business side of it. Uh, I mean, obviously I know some parts, but it just completely transfers to any business. So I'm very grateful that you shared those insights and those stories. Um, I definitely have a better understanding of esports now. So thank you for sharing that as well. I'd love to roll out the red carpet for you. Do you have anything to promote? Where can people find you? Where is your podcast? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so definitely sorry to you know promote. But like I said, you've got to be a good. I have your audience. You've listened to the end. So um, definitely, you know, I would say people should, you know, look at um the book of esports, which you can buy anywhere books are sold. But, you know, Amazon is probably the place most people go to. So you can look there. You can look out for my podcast, The Business of Esports. And if you want to see what I'm doing in the space more as from a business perspective, you can look at EEG. It's a public company. You can take a look and see what they're announcing and all their press releases and learn more about, you know, and follow me that way. Um, and you can also find me on, you know, Twitter and LinkedIn. LinkedIn and Twitter are probably the best ways to connect with me. Um, both are basically just my name. Um, pretty easy to find. Um, I think there's an underscore in my Twitter name, William Collis. But um, yeah, if you're curious and you enjoyed it, maybe that's the last thing to take away is like, please reach out to me. You know what I mean? Like, I really mean it. I think most people don't realize how responsive people are if they take the time to write a nice note or say something. So if you heard something that's interesting or exciting to you, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, 
ping me and you know who knows i mean i got a lot of amazing mentorship from people when i was building my businesses you know don't be shy about reaching out and starting conversations thank you so much for being on and uh, hope to see you soon if you like this episode you can check out our most recent one here and if you haven't already make sure you click here to subscribe and see the next one but if you're interested in more tips and tricks, then make sure to join our Facebook group where you can find thousands of like-minded people and you get direct access and support to any business question.